Hello everyone and welcome to my channel this is the 33rd part of what if Deku had psychokinesis I hope you enjoy link to the original story and author in the description. Chapter 33, Confessions Part 2 With a disgusted grunt, the newspaper in Tamura hands disintegrated away, I don't believe this crap. All the news can talk about is that bastard stain. Still no mention of us, then? Bah! They finally did today, but on the back page. Rumors speculate that the hero killer and League of Villains orchestrated the attack on Hosa City. That's all. Of course, they're still spouting that bullcrap that it took all might and endeavor to take Stain out. Doesn't mention the brats at all, except four children rescued in the fight. Hey, Kirojiri, why don't we pop over to this news station and dust a few reporters? That'll teach them a lesson. An amused voice came from the monitor, come now, Tamira. There is no need for that. Remember what you are supposed to be doing right now. Tamira sighed and scratched at his stitched up wounds, get healed up and focus on finding new members. That's right. Master, with the loss of stain, I fear recruiting is back to how it was before, Kirojiri said. I apologize for this. A deep chuckle made both Kirojiri and Tamira glance over at the monitor, fear not. The attack last night is already having a ripple effect. It appears that Stain did us one last favor before he was taken away. Someone must have been close enough to record him being loaded up and got quite the piece of the footage footage that is already beginning to spread. The government is trying to suppress it, of course, but it's out in the wild now. When the right people see this, they will come to you, Tamira. Very soon, the League of Villains will have true monsters in its ranks. Tamira tapped the bar as he thought about that, it sounds like I'll be getting nothing but Stain fans though. Undoubtedly, some will be followers of him, or they may be those who hate this world and see Stain and, now by extension, the League as an agent of change. Others may see you as a way to kill heroes and cause chaos. There are so many different perspectives to this now, but they will all be coming to you. And it will be your job to find the ones that will help further your goals. With a sigh, Tamira leaned against the bar and reached behind for a bottle, sounds like a lot of work. Ha 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 ha. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. But fear not, you are not alone, Tamira. In fact, I may have a new member for you shortly. Oh? The good doctor has recently found a promising man who has volunteered to help him with some experiments. This man has his own group of followers, and I believe we will be able to work out a temporary exchange of manpower. Walking out of the examination room, Tenya bowed towards the doctor and offered him his thanks for his care. With a hand on his arm, Tenya walked down the hall and continued to do what he had been doing ever since yesterday. Think in silence. He was grateful towards Izuku and Shuto that they had allowed him his solitude. They kept to themselves and spoke in low voices. Even the topics of their talks were over things that were clearly meant to avoid the one topic they knew Tenya was racking his brain over. Himiko Toga. He just couldn't pin down his feelings over the subject. Duty versus friendship. Healing versus accountability. Victim versus villain. A friend versus a monster. Every time he thought he had a handle on one side, the other side of the coin flipped over and threw every everything back into chaos. He knew there were certain things he had learned about Himiko that he could not overlook. Certain things he couldn't reason away like Izuku had. Izuku by his very nature was kind. Tenya was dutiful. Or at least he normally was. After Stain had hurt his brother, Tenya's whole moral compass had been flipped on its head. He had abandoned reason and duty for his own selfish reasons and others had paid the price for it. Izuka's broken body flashed before his eyes and then Himiko, face cut open and a sword impaled through her chest. Again, his thoughts were thrown into disarray because he couldn't look at Himiko just as a victim of his choices, but also a victim of her own. After all, you hear about villains turning on each other all the time. Tenya clucked his tongue. How can he possibly decide on what to do when he couldn't even decide how he viewed her? Ah, Mr. Ida. Good to see you up and about. Tenya was jolted from his thoughts and turned around in a hurry, Principal Nizu, sir. 
bowing immediately towards the small principal, yes, sir. I just finished with my last checkup. Excellent. You are perhaps free, then? I, yes? Good. Then would you care to join me for a cup of tea? Mizu ended up taking Tenya to a private room, explaining that being the principal got him a few luxuries. Like access to private rooms, normally used for meetings. While Tenya took his seat, Nizu quickly began to prepare two cups of tea for them. Handing Tenya a cup, Nizu took his seat. Tenya took a sip before asking, Principal, sir. May I ask why you are still here? Paperwork, I'm afraid. So many things to fill out. You wouldn't believe how many forms there are for something like insurance. Though perhaps you will when you take over Team I to 10. Running an agency requires a lot of paperwork. Tenya frowned, that's. Nizu waved a paw, that's something for much later though. For now, you have many more important things to focus on. And I'm gu guessing, more than a few questions. Tenya took his time to respond. Looking down at his reflection in his cup, sir. Why did you allow Toga into UA? Nizu took a sip. That is a question I've had to ask myself and have been asked many many times. By colleagues, friends, and more than a few people I actively dislike. Tartarus? Nizu nodded, them, the police force, the Hero Safety Commission, and the staff at UA. Though, of course, no one from the school falls into the actively disliked section. Bringing Toga in was questioned, argued over, flat out rejected as insane and almost came to blows more than a few times. However, my fellow teachers all came around to the idea, if some, slower than others. Came to blows? Do you mean what was happening down in the lobby and then in Toba's room? Close. Though that morning was an extreme case, and I assure you, the air around Nizu darkened even while his voice remained light and chipper, there will be consequences for Tartarus opening fire and shooting Midoriya. Tenya gulped. But, Nizu continued on, I haven't answered your question have I? The answer is simple. It's a hero's job to stop villains, even if that means stopping a person from becoming one. Tenya straightened in his seat as he waited for Nizu to continue. But after a few seconds it was clear that was going to be it, that's it? Nizu nodded, that is what I told the faculty when I decided to let Toga in. Of course, I had to go and prove security for her. Plans to ensure that all the other students would not be in danger and of course there was what we would do if Midoriya didn't make it in. Tenya let that sink in, you make it sound like it was a real danger to take her in. Nizu rubbed his chin, I suppose after hearing her story, you must have some vague idea of what she was like. How dangerous she must have been. Yes, yes, Tenya didn't feel all that good answering in the affirmative so quickly. Well, let me assure you, whatever picture you have in your mind about how Toga was like when we got her, it doesn't even come close. W.H. what? It's not an exaggeration when I say Toga was one step from becoming a true villain. The way she viewed the world, other people and herself were twisted in the worst possible ways. She was less a person and more hmm, not an animal since we aren't cruel for cruelty's sake, more like an elemental. But instead of fire, wind or water, she was an elemental of violence and blood. And yet, an act of kindness opened up a path for her. A path that could save her from becoming the monster Teratarus thinks she is, and saving all the innocent lives she'd take before she was stopped. What kind of hero school would UA be if the heroes teaching there didn't do what they could to save someone when given the chance? And that's what Midoriya did. He gave her a chance. You talk about the lives you are trying to save, but what about the lives she's already taken? The people she's hurt. According to her they weren't innocents, but they were still people. Murder is murder. Nizu sighed, you're right. For all the good we have done, and are trying to do for her, those lives can never be brought back. We can rationalize it in so many different ways, but that doesn't change the truth. And it will be a truth that Toga will be forced to live with for the rest of her life. A truth that she is slowly beginning to realize. Beginning to? Nizu finished his cup and poured himself another one, according to the courts, doctors, and the several psychiatrists that were able to get close for long enough to come to a conclusion, 
Toga was deemed not of sound judgment. Judgment. She suffered a psychotic break because she was starved of blood. After, she was manipulated so that her psychosis was ever present. She was aware of what she was doing, but in her state of mind she experienced no guilt or remorse. Now though, I'm not sure that's the case. Why do you think that? Her actions recently, especially once school started, showed an increase in empathy. She began to have reasons behind her actions. Granted, most of the time they are her own reasons that only she can understand, but they were no longer actions driven by her violent and bloodthirsty tendencies. But she still acts out. She doesn't seem, she isn't normal. Don't confuse normal with fixed. Toga will never be a role model student. The damage done to her, coupled with her experiences in the world, have left their mark. That will always be a part of her. They will never be removed. What can happen, though, is that she can experience new things that can layer and build on her. Covering the old scars of her life. They'll still be there, but she'll be more than them. She told us she doesn't like the changes, though. She fights them. Nizu nodded, oh, she does. She is still very much the wild elemental, just not as violent and bloody. This process is still young. She's only been with us a few months, remember, and she must be given a wide berth. If she feels constrained, then she will lash out. So we give her space and make sure that she feels in control as often as we can. She is of course under constant watch and, Nizu took a sip of his tea and there was a mischievous glint in his eyes, and this bit stays between us. She doesn't get away with nearly as much as she thinks she does. So we know when she's being bad for herself. And we know when she's being bad for others. Others? We didn't, we didn't tell her you were going to Hosa City. She found that out on her own. And then decided to follow after you. Tenya's eyes went wide. The thought had never crossed his mind. He never considered just how Himiko found out where he was going. Never thought how she put the pieces together that he was going to go after Stain. Well, Mr. Ida, I think I have some more paperwork to work on. I think Manuel will be joining me as well, now that I think about it. He should be here by now. Getting up, Nizu walked for the door but stopped before leaving, do think about what we've talked about. I know what you've heard may have colored your thoughts on Toga, but I think you should consider this. The girl she described herself as, is that the girl that came to save you? Himiko hummed as she examined her back in her bathroom mirror. With her hospital gown raised up, she got a good look at her other new scar. It was just as high up as the one on her chest, but off to the side a few inches. You're lucky, you know, Aizawa said gruffly. Wrapped up in his sleeping back and facing away from his slightly undressed student, Stain's sword missed your spine by less than an inch. If he had hit that, your best case scenario would be paralysis. Reaching around Himiko ran a finger over the scar, what, can't recovery girl fix something as simple as a severed spine? Midnight placed a school suitcase on Himiko's bed, she has limits. And so does modern medicine. Some things just aren't fixable right now. Himiko let her gown drop back down, yeah, yeah. No robot spine or robot eyes can't be a cyborg just yet. On the bright side, looks like everything else is all healed up nicely. Himiko leaned into the mirror to look at her eye. With the bandage now removed, she was able to get a good look at it, recovery girl did a good job. I'll have to thank her next time I see her. Just need to make sure I don't run into her, what with me not having depth perception now. Aizawa and Midnight shared a quick look, how bad is it? Himiko Himiko blew out a raspberry and walked out of the bathroom. Pulling on a new black eye patch Midnight had brought for her when she got back from the other errand she had been running for Himiko, I'm already used to it. Nothing to worry about. Still, when you are released and returned to UA, I want you to go through a few combat exercises with ectoplasm. Understand? Aizawa said, making it pretty plain that the subject was not up for debate. Not that Himiko felt like arguing. She had planned to ask her favorite target practice for a few rounds anyway. Walking over to the bed, her mood took a more serious turn. Anyway, were you able to get everything? 
I don't see the sword. The sword is evidence. It's Stain's murder weapon, so of course I wasn't going to be able to get it for you. Don't know why you want it after he almost killed you with it. You're lucky I was able to get your costume for you, Midnight said as she opened the case, or what's left of it. Inside the case was the remains of Himiko's hero costume. Most of it was now sliced and tattered. Her knives were cracked or shattered, and the syringes were in pieces. Reaching down, Himiko pulled up her hero top and poked a finger through the hole in the chest and back, wiggling it a bit before dropping the top back down. She then pulled out her old mask, a carbon copy of the one that Stain wore. It was still tied in a knot at the back but was cut clean through over the right eye hole. She kept it in her hand as she walked over to the nightstand by her bed. I guess it was for my own satisfaction. Was planning on breaking it while I burned the rest. I guess I can see you wanting to do that, wait? Burn what? Opening a drawer, Himiko pulled out a small lighter, oh, I'm burning my old costume. Aizawa was out of his sleeping bag in a flash and yanked the lighter out of Himiko's ha hands, no starting fires inside the hospital. Hey! Toga, what are you thinking? And where did you even get that? Midnight shook her head in disbelief as Aizawa handed her the lighter. Himiko pouted. Tossing the mask back into the briefcase and crossing her arms, I wasn't going to do it inside the damned hospital. When Midnight held up the lighter with a raised eyebrow, Himiko rolled her eye, one of the nurses that comes in here smokes. So you stole it. Borrowed with no intent to return. Midnight ground her fingers into her temple, okay, putting that aside. Why do you want to burn your costume? You expect me to wear something that makes me look like Mr. Stain after what happened? Midnight glanced down at the costume. She supposed some of what Himiko said made sense. The costume was made to mimic the person she idolized. And now said person had not only almost killed her, but also her friends and the boy she was in love with. In hindsight, Midnight should be glad Himiko was apparently moving past her stain obsession. Why fire, though? Himiko shrugged, I dunno. Seemed like the right thing to do. What's that old saying, burning bridges? Well, that costume is the last bridge to my past. No way in hell I'm going back now, so might as well make it official, I guess. Besides, you can't tell me neither of you have ever wanted to burn something. No was her teacher's quick and decisive answer to that. You guys are boring. Moving on. While I'm glad you've decided to take a serious step and move past Stain, I can't let you burn your costume. Himiko groaned, I wasn't going to burn the hospital down. There's that, but also, do you know how expensive the materials used to make your costume are? Ow, oh, ow. Oh. Remember, everything, from the fabric to the metal for your knives, was fabricated and treated so that it wouldn't get destroyed when you use your quirk over it. A lot of R&D went into making every bit of this. So it's very expensive to make from scratch. The support department will want to recycle the remains into whatever your new costume is. Himiko sighed and plopped down onto her bed. She couldn't really argue Midnight's points. It was still boring, though. Any chance for her to try to come up with some excuse so she could burn everything was interrupted by a knock on the door. Midnight and Aizawa both turned to look at it while Himiko laid down, not all that interested. After everything, she couldn't imagine anyone would be stupid enough to try and get to her now. Don't think the nurses are due back for another bed check just yet, Aizawa said as he got out of his sleeping bag, his hand reaching up to the back of his belt where his combat knife was. Midnight walked over to the door, yes? Who is it? It's Ida, Midnight Sensei. Himiko sat back up in a hurry, Tenya? I'd, I'd like a chance to talk with Toga. If she is able. Midnight turned to look at Himiko and was a little shocked to see the girl looking nervous. She was fidgeting in place, picking at her eye patch and looking a little pale. Midnight supposed there was a reason for that. Out of the group of friends she had told, only Tenya had not accepted her back as a friend. Saying he needed time to think things through. Toga, is this something you want Dash? Let him in. Himiko was nervous, but she wasn't about to run away from this. 
If what was coming was what she expected, she'd rather just get it over with. Midnight nodded and opened the door, hello, Ida. Tenya bowed in greeting to Midnight, and then to Aizawa, senseis. When he looked at Himiko, his eyes were briefly drawn to the black eye patch she was wearing, Toga. I take it you've come up with an answer then? I have, Tenya said as he glanced around at the two teachers as they each took a seat on the other side of the room. Aizawa wave, waved him off, given the recent issues with local authorities in Tartarus, until Toga is back at UA she will be kept under constant watch at all times. I see. Himiko could hear the hesitation in Tenya's voice and groaned, just say what you want to say to me. Pretend they aren't even here. Honestly, they'll hear about it anyway since I'd have to talk about this during my therapy sessions with Midnight. Which then gets passed to the principal, who makes nice little reports for everyone. Midnight frowned, I'm not gossiping about you. And I don't tell Nizu everything we talk about. You still have some privacy. I make sure of that. Not mad, just stating that I know how the game is played. But anyway, don't let them being here be a problem, Himiko shifted her attention back to Tenya, who nodded in response. I spoke with Principal Nizu. He told me the reason UA took you in. To prevent you from becoming a villain. Yup. He wants me to be a good little girl. Like you try to pretend to be. Tenya's remark cut through all the airs Himiko had started to put up, leaving her bare. She frowned but didn't say anything to counter. That's what you said when you confronted Stain. All of this is a show you put on for our friends and for the teachers. That you weren't the good person you pretended to be. Himiko leaned forward, you're avoiding the real word I used to describe myself. Go on. Say it. You called yourself a monster. Himiko laughed, a bitter cold laugh, you know, it's refreshing to finally have someone say it like it is. You know what I've done now, and I bet Nizu painted a better picture for you, didn't he? He did, he did. He said when you came to UA, you were more a living element of violence and blood. But after a few months of therapy and hero training, I'm now a good girl. Right? No. I've tried to separate the you I've spent these last few weeks with and the you you describe yourself as. However, you aren't two different people, and I have to stop trying to see you as such. Seeing how you lash out at the rules that were put in place to help you, and then hearing what you did to all those people and learning the selfish reason you came to UA, I don't think you are a good person, Toga. Himiko rubbed her brow, ignoring the twisted feelings in her gut and chest, that I guess there isn't anything else to say. Wrong. Eh? What else is there? You just said I wasn't a good person. We agree. What else is there to say? I said I don't think you are a good person. I don't know that for sure yet. I do know that you are not the monster you claim to be when you confronted Stain. Himiko blinked while her mouth opened and closed a few times as she tried to collect her thoughts. You may not be a good person, but you're not a monster. You're something else. And what exactly am I? Someone who is trying to become a good person and is starting to figure out what that all entails. Himiko shook her head, okay, you lost me. Midoriya was right. When you talked about yourself, you always mentioned how you felt in the past tense. I didn't instead of I don't. And that means what, exactly? You're starting to care about what you did. You're starting to have empathy for others, and you're starting to regret the things you did. Bold claim. You suddenly a shrink too, now? Tenya just shook his head, no, but the way you were acting these last few days, a monster wouldn't act like that. You were worried I'd get myself hurt, so you did what you had to do to try and stop me. And when I was in danger, you could have run away, but you threw yourself into a situation where you could have died. Then after that, when the whole truth about you was about to come crashing down, I think you tried to twist the situation so that we would be so mad, so disgusted with you that when Tartarus came to take you, we'd let them. Instead of fighting to protect you. You were thinking of us, instead of yourself. That isn't something a monster would do. Himiko flinched like she had been slapped across the face. You came to UA as a monster, and maybe you want to believe you still are one like you told Stain. 
but I don't think that's true anymore. You aren't absolved of your responsibilities. Your past actions are yours to make right, and I don't know how many good deeds it takes to level the scale of a single bad one. I don't know how long it'll take for you to become the person you say you're pretending to be, a good person, but I do know this. I want to help you continue on this road you unwittingly started on when you followed after Midoriya. Someone in the room was crying. Himiko was almost certain it wasn't her. The wet stuff on her cheeks was just condensation. Toga, I can't ignore what you've done, nor can I feel comfortable that you a, a place that that's supposed to house the best and brightest future generation of heroes, has taken such a risk by letting someone like you in. But at the same time, I can't abandon you after you didn't abandon me. A hero wouldn't do that, but more importantly a friend wouldn't. Toga, I want to help you become the hero that the UA wants you to become. I want to help you become the person Yurarika and Midoriya know that you really are. Himiko kept wiping her cheeks, wishing that whatever was dripping from the ceiling would stop, what the hell is going on? It feels like I've lost my touch with lying to people. I should not be this easy to read. Tenya, for the first time he walked into the room, smiled, to be fair, I'm just following Midoriya and Yurarika's example. They seem to get a pretty good read on you from yesterday. So taking what they said, what Principal Nizu said, and then everything you've done recently, well, Tenya shrugged, I'm supposed to be smart, so even if it took some time, I could put the pieces together. Himiko started to laugh, oh god, if Azuka's starting to figure me out, I'm in trouble. She took a few breaths to calm herself, though there was still a tone of giddiness to her voice, so, what does this make us then? If you still want, I'd like to be your friend Toga. Himiko smirked, a friend that's going to be watching me like a hawk to make sure I stay on the straight and narrow, right? Tenya pushed his glasses up, before using the hand to chop at the air in Himiko's direction, I am still the class representative of 1A. As such it is my duty to ensure that all my classmates continue to act in accordance with the rules and regulations that UA expects of us. And if there are those in my class that require extra attention, I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't give them my full attention. Himiko let her head roll back as she let out the loudest annoyed groan she, she could, Griawaad. First, I picked up a BDSM mommy, and now it's like I picked up an older brother. Writing herself, Himiko leapt off the bed, oh to hell with it, and walked over to Tenya and extended a hand out, I'm not going to make things easy for you. Tenya took her hand, I expect not. But I look forward to the trouble all the same. With the two now coming to an understanding, the tension between them was all but gone. They both expected they would be butting heads in the future, but they were okay with that. And apparently Tenya was ready to deliver the first head but, now I think we should get going. Eh? Tenya's arms chopped at the air as he emphasized the importance of what they needed to do, Principal Nizu let me know that Manuel is in the hospital. As we both misused his internship offer for our own selfish reasons, we must immediately make amends and apologize to him. Himiko blinked and backed away. Putting on her best apologetic face oh, but I can't go moving around the hospital. I have to stay in this room. So dash. Actually as long as you have a teacher accompanying you, you're free to walk around, Aizawa said as he rolled back up into his sleeping bag. And I don't mind going with you for this. I think Ida makes a valid point. You two duo, that man an apology, Midnight added with a smile. Himiko hissed, but Tenya ignored it, excellent. Then I will wait outside as you get yourself ready. Afterwards, when Midoriya is done with his checkup with Recovery Girl and Todoroki is done with his checkup, perhaps we can all meet up and have a chance to talk before myself and Todoroki leave. Yeah, that should be fun, Himiko said, doing her best not to grind her teeth flat because she did genuinely like the idea of hanging out with her friends before they had to leave. Because she was still shocked she had friends. Then I will wait for you outside. When Tenya left, Himiko immediately pointed at midnight, not a word from you. But that was just so adorable. Midnight cried, dabbing a tissue to dry her eyes. Ah! I think I would have liked it better if he hated me, Himiko said as she went searching for a pair of slippers she could wear. Oh, we both know that's a lie. Shut it. You know, I'm proud of you, Toga, Midnight said with a smile. 
You've changed so much since you first came, and even more so since school started. Himiko waved her off, oh please. I'm still the same monster I was when I got here. Now where are those damn slippers? Want to get this over with. We both know you would have never washed off Midoriya's blood before, Himiko winced as midnight continued, and I doubt you would have ever referred to yourself as a monster. It used to be that after what happened in junior high, you became the real you. Now it's, you became a monster. Himiko, finally finding her slippers, put them on and headed for the door, maybe the real me is a monster. A hand on her shoulder stopped her. Turning, she saw Midnight looking down at her, a soft, almost motherly shine in her eyes, look me in the eye and tell me you believe that. Tell me you're the same person you were back then. Himiko stayed silent for a while, eyes darting back and forth, before she turned, shrugged off Midnight's hand and left. Midnight followed after her, flashing Aizawa a quick thumbs up that the near undead teacher rolled his eyes at before zipping up his sleeping bag and going to sleep. T.Ida, once Midoriya and Todoroki are done with their medical visits it should be late enough in the day for us to have lunch together before myself and Todoroki leave. I will inquire with our teachers if there is a spot we will be able to eat with some privacy for Toba's continued protection. Ochako blinked at the message, in particular the ending. If Ida is talking about Toga like that, then they must have squared away their issues. That's good to know. Ochak, Ochako quickly typed out a response, agreeing that lunch sounded good before lying back down on her bed. At this point all she could do was wait and relax until she heard back from everyone. Boring, but after the adventures she had just had the past couple of days, she could deal with a little boredom. Knock knock knock. Hello? Ochako looked over at the door, it's Oak Dash. Wham! The run slammed open and a surprisingly short hero burst into the room, runt. Finally! Ochako bolted up, Miruko? Well, look at you. I was worried you might still be in rough shape, but here you are, lounging it up while I'm still stuck doing more paperwork than I've ever had to do in my whole life. Thank you oh so much for getting me involved in a freaking cover-up. That's exactly what I want to spend my time dealing with. Had to finally just run away for a bit or else I'd go insane. Ochako winced, sorry about that, before she got a cheeky grin, but I'm sure that someone from your agency should be able to help you with all your paperwork. Ochako fell onto her bed laughing as Miruko glared at her, laugh it up kid. Pretty soon I'm going to get me a sidekick and it'll be their job to do all this crap busy work. Pfft, Ochako tried to get her laughing under control, who are you going to get that'll be crazy enough to work for you? Turning over, she looked up at Miruko who was looking down at her with a raised eyebrow. Eh? Ochako pointed towards herself and Miruko nodded, eh? Wait what? Runt, you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the most dangerous bastards there is and you walked away. I'd be crazy to let someone like you slip away. But sidekick, wait, is this a job offer? But I'm still in school and dash. Whoa. Let's not jump the gun. This is me telling you that I want first dibs on you for all your future internships and work studies. Of course, the boastful aura around Miruko mellowed some as she took a seat next to Ochako, if that's what you want, want. I know I wasn't exactly the best teacher to you these past couple of days. I still have a lot of paperwork to get through, but I'd be done in time to pick you up tomorrow so we can get two more days of work done. If you want to keep training this week. Yes, Ochako answered instantly, to all of it. Yes. Ha, after the time I gave you, I expected a little more hesitation, Miruko said with a surprised but happy smile. I need to get stronger. Ochako looked down at her hands as she spoke, seeing my friends get so hurt made me feel so useless. All I could do was flail around and hope for a miracle instead of being able to save them. What's worse, last night was the second time Deku put himself in harm's way to save my life. Both times a Nomu almost killed him. He's my best friend and I couldn't, Ochako stopped herself from screaming. She took several calming breaths before continuing, I want to be able to save people. I want to be able to protect my friends in. I never want to see Deku get hurt because I wasn't strong enough to protect myself or him. I need to get stronger, Miruko. I have to. 
if I'm not strong then I won't be able to do anything. All right then, Miruko said. Clapping her hands together excitedly and a new smirk forming on her face, if you want to get stronger, then that's what you'll get. She then deflated a little adding, after I finish with all the paperwork, which will take me the rest of the day. But tomorrow you're coming with me. We'll still have two days to drill some techniques into you. Ochako blinked and started to get excited, techniques? Like some of your techniques? Like some of your super moves maybe? Not more, let's get you angry lessons? Miruko laughed and slapped Ochako on the back, almost knocking her off the bed, ha. Huh? The fact you went around with stain tells me you got the whole mindset stuff down. Now we can work on making you a better fighter. You've put my biggest worry to bed, kid. Congrats. She paused and looked away thoughtfully, scratching her ear as she said, course you still have those distractions. Miruko could feel Ochako's eyes on her and winced, okay, that might have been a bad choice of words there. Ochako had titles to the side as she looked at Miruko quizzically, what do you mean by distractions? Miruko frowned before taking a breath, okay, runt. Here's the deal. You want to protect your friends, right? Yeah. And in particular, that boy that got real messed up. Deku? Yeah, I want to protect him. He's my best friend. We, we started our journey to become heroes together. Is that a fact? Naruko kept herself subdued as Ochako spoke and she listened. Yeah. We spent a year working together to pass UA's entrance exam. We're both helping each other become the best heroes we can. We've even talked about teaming up in the future. We even came up with our own team name, Ochako was fidgeting with her fingers as she finished. A smile on her lips. Miruko saw that and groaned to herself, okay. Runt, I'm going to offer you some advice. You're not going to take it, that much is painfully obvious, but I feel like I have a responsibility to tell you it regardless. Okay? If it were me. If I were in your shoes right now. I'd cut them off. Especially that green kid and all these little ideas of getting stronger together and teaming up. Ochako couldn't wrap her head around that. What Miruko had said was just too absurd to even understand. So she was left with only one response, huh? I'm saying that if you want to get strong, if you want to protect your friends, provide for your family, all that stuff? You have to cut them out of your life. Being around people you care about will distract you in teams, either you're the stronger hero and you get held back by the weaker ones, or you're the weaker hero and then you're the one putting the stronger, stronger hero at risk. Ochako shook her head, no. No, that's all wrong. You're telling me to cut off everything that I'm fighting to get stronger for. My reasons. I'm getting stronger for them. Without them I. I wouldn't even be myself anymore. I can't do that. I won't. I know, runt. I know. All I can tell you is what I'd be doing right now. I get that they're your source of strength. I just think you need to consider your options going forward and think about what's in your best interest. And Thierre. This was definitely advice Ochako couldn't see herself taking, but the more she thought about it, the more she thought about Naruko. And the reasons why she might be saying these things, do you have issues trusting other people? I don't understand why you would want to cut people off like this. Is this why you don't like teams? Naruko leaned forward and clasped her hands together. Her ears lowered and she spoke in a mellow, almost withdrawn and tired tone that was shocking to Ochako, depending on others is risky. I've learned to trust myself, and it's gotten me through a lot of shit. But besides that, even if the best case happens and you get on a team that isn't bound for failure that leads to another issue, you'll start forming bonds. Bonds with teammates, bonds with family, friends, and lovers. As far as I'm concerned, this is potentially the worst thing a hero can have. Why? Why would that be so bad? Because bonds break, runt. Ochako was off the bed in an instant so she could stand in front of Miruko, no. I won't even consider that. My friends, my family would never do something like that. They'd never betray me. 
but they could die. Ochako froze at Miruko's words. Or you could, could die, Miruko finished. She waited to let that sink in and the loss of color in Ochako's face let her know it had. Runt, I'll let you in on a secret. Everything I do, from the way I travel the country, to not having an agency, to avoiding teams, living my life at a hundred miles per hour every single day. It's because I know that eventually, no matter how strong you are, how good you are, death comes for everyone. Ochako fought back the images of Azuku's broken body. The feeling of terror when she pulled him out of the water and she couldn't feel a heartbeat. Even heroes aren't immune. In fact, I'd say we court death every single day. Ochako could see Thirteen getting ripped apart by her own quirk. Could see All Might's mutilated left side. The horrible scar that had robbed him of so much, but, but heroes. How many heroes can you name right now that lived long enough to retire? Ochako knew some. She knew there were old heroes. Izuku had shown her some. But at that moment, they all escaped her. Live every day like it could be your last and make sure when you're gone, you're not hurting anyone besides yourself. Life is cruel, runt, there's no reason why your death should add to the suffering of others. Naruko's advice was cruel. It was harsh, and it left Ochako feeling cold and empty. It was advice from a hero that was rising up through the ranks. A hero that had cut herself off from so much so she could keep moving forward without being slowed down. Ochako couldn't help but draw some similarities between Naruko and All Might. Their way of being a hero might work, but it just seemed so lonely and twisted. As Ochako stood in front of Naruko and she thought about everything she had said, Ochako couldn't help but ask, what about me? Doesn't you coming here and offering to keep training me fly in the face of everything you just said? Naruko laughed, her regular spirit returning as reached up and poked Ochako in the forehead, I decided to train you on a whim, remember? And then you had to go and impress me. Maybe you're worth the risk, or maybe I'm just horrible at practicing, practicing what I preach. What's that saying? Do as I say and not as I do. Dot. Ruffling Ochako's hair, Miruko stood back up, well anyway, you might be too tied up with your friends to be able to cut and run now. Hell, trying it at this point might do more damage than good. My friends are too important to me. I? I get what you were trying to tell me, but it's just not something I can do. Miruko rubbed her chin as she looked at Ochako, a smug smile forming, I suppose I should give you some kind of useful advice before I get out of here and finish the mountain of paperwork I left behind to come visit you. Hmm. Ochako suddenly felt nervous as Naruko's eyes drilled into her. There was a dangerous twinkle in the hero's eyes, remember what I said about hesitating? Yeah. That doesn't have to just apply to your enemies. Eh? Oh, and give my regards to that green kid you were glued to last night. I hear he's doing better. See you tomorrow, runt. Oh, um, yeah, Ochako tried to think just what Miruko was talking about as the hero walked for the door. She felt that smug grin meant Maruko was trying to be clever, and it really worried her when Maruko got like that. Just what else could she mean I shouldn't hesitate with besides enemies? What's the opposite of enemies? Friends? No, that doesn't work. Opposite of enemies, love dash. It then clicked that Maruko had brought up Izuku almost as an afterthought right after giving her that piece of advice, Maruko. Hold it. Naruko was already gone when Ochako whirled around, laughing to herself as she heard Ochako scream after her, ha 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 ha. Runt, you're too easy. Walking down the hallways, Naruko sighed as she thought back to what she had said to Ochako. After everything that had happened in that alleyway the night before, she had to admit to herself that Ochako had grown on her. Which she was sure was going to lead to all kinds of problems. God damn it, Rumi. Don't be going soft just because you like the kid. Still, even after spending so much time on her own, doing her own thing, she didn't hate the idea that she had grown attached to someone. Though that didn't mean she wasn't going to make Ochako pay for it when she got her hands on her. If anything, her training was going to be even tougher now that she had an emotional investment. All Might. 
All Might had been so focused on his upcoming visit with Recovery Girl and Izuku that he had not noticed that he had been followed down the hospital hallway. It was only when he was called out to that he finally turned to see who had been able to sneak up on him. A shameful moment quickly followed when he saw that it was Endeavor walking up to him. How'd I miss him? Smiling, All Might waved at the other hero, Ah Endeavor. I supposed you're here to pick up young Todoroki. I hear he was given a clean bill of health and cleared to be released this morning. Actually, why is he wanting to talk to me at all? After the Hero Commission and Police Force's decision to credit us with Stain's capture, I figured he wouldn't want to talk to anyone. All Might noted that the permanent scowl the firewielder always had was indeed darker and angrier. So the man was obviously in a worse mood than normal, which was saying something. Yes. Shuto will be leaving with me today. Though he has insisted he be allowed to talk with his friends before he goes. However, before that, we need to talk. About what? The boy you've decided to take under your wing. All Might smile wavered, young Midoriya? I'm surprised. I never took you for someone willing to take a realistic approach to your legacy like I did. But clearly your results have bore fruit as well. My ha? Huh? Though the bo boy's mother didn't strike me as being powerful herself, Endeavor rubbed his chin in thought, knowing you, perhaps it was a whim of fancy and you didn't know what you were making. Inko? Whim of fancy? Making? I am totally lost here. Still to find a woman with two unique quirks like that to mix with. Lucky. But dangerous. Air, Mrs. Midoriya, only possesses one quirk. The one young Midoriya has been using all this time. Endeavor blinked, but that fire? To the best of my knowledge, the fire breath comes from his father. Endeavor stared at All Might for a long time, his father. Yes? For the first time in his life, All Might watched as Endeavor, a man who always seemed angry, looked completely flummoxed. It only lasted for a second, but it was a moment that All Might felt he should cherish. He doubted he'd ever see it again. Okay, moving on. I wanted to talk to you about the boy's fire, anyway. The boy clearly lacks control. I imagine that's why he didn't use it in the sports festival. However, as his teacher and as someone that clearly has set his eye on him for training, you need to get it under control. I can tell that no work has been put into it. That kind of irresponsibility is not acceptable. Endeavor, All Might cut in, no work has been put into helping young Midoriya master and protect himself from his quirk because until that night he didn't have it. What? This is the first time that young Midoriya's fire breath has manifested. Up until now, he only had his psychokinesis. How is that possible? I'm on my way to speak with Recovery Girl on this very topic. I see. If this was his first time using his quirk, then his lack of resistance to his own fire could make sense. And if he's already developed his quirk factor to the state it's in now, it could also explain why his fire was so powerful its first time. All Might watched Endeavor closely as he chose his next words, Endeavor. Why are you so interested in this? Something flashed in Endeavor's eyes before the man buried it just as quickly. Replacing it with a dangerous smirk that split his face, I make it a point to find sidekicks with fire and heat-based quirks. Do you really think I'm going to pass on somebody with a power combo like that? However, since neither you or anyone else in the UA staff has a fire-based quirk, I'll give you some advice. That boy's fire is powerful, but it's going to be a double-edged sword. Unlike my Shudo who can use his ice to offset the downsides of his fire, that boy doesn't have that safety net. So that fire, if overused, will cause his own body to overheat. His body does seem to have some resilience to it or else his burns would have been closer to what that the Nomo suffered. Endeavor paused and rubbed his chin in thought, thinking back, this might explain how he was able to take the hits from that explosion boy in Shudo and still win the sports festival. However, his resilience is still not strong enough to handle his own fire fully if he's going to use it like he did last night. Heatstroke and burns are still a major risk since he has no way to offset his power like my son does. I would advise that he gets a handle on it as quickly as possible. Learn to use smaller flames instead of going all in on one attack. 
before. Before he causes himself too much damage. Any kind of lack of control can be fatal. If Shudo hadn't been there, odds are the boy would be dead. Thank you for your words of advice. I will be sure to bring them up when I consult with the staff and recovery girl over how to handle young Midoriya's new power. Endeavor's face remained neutral as he turned around to leave, just make sure you don't let that boy become damaged before I get a hold of him. Recovery girl glanced around the room. She had been able to secure a private room so that she, All Might, Gran Torino and Izuku could talk. So, what do you want to start with? Recovery girl asked as she tapped a manila folder full of papers. Izuku, Gran Torino, and All Might all glanced at each other. When it looked like the two heroes were going to let him pick where this started, Izuku gulped and decided to get the more obvious question out of the way, why can I breathe fire now? I have two theories, but unfortunately no solid answer. Wait, seriously? Izuku didn't look convinced. Spontaneously developing a new quirk isn't something that just happens, you know, recovery girl said as she took a seat. So this isn't a one-for-all thing? All Might and Gran Torino glanced at each other, kid, why would you think that? Just because you got one-for-all doesn't mean you're suddenly going to pop out a new quirk. That's not how it works. And besides, don't you think I would have warned you if something like this was going to happen? Izuka shrugged, I dunno. Maybe this was how previous one for all bearers got hazed by their predecessors. All Might balked at the idea, I would never do that. Nana would, Gran Torino said with a nod. I mean, probably, but I'm nice. Ahem. Recover girl cleared her throat, getting everyone's attention, considering one for all is a quirk that stockpiles power from one person to the next and boosts the current holder's own natural abilities, I think it's safe to assume that it's not the root cause of Midoriya's fire breath quirk. So you think it's something else? Izuku asked. Like I said, I have two theories as to what happened. The first relies on your quirk being misdiagnosed as a child. Izuku tilted his head to the side, huh? How soon after you demonstrated your quirk did you go see a doctor? Izuku scratched his head as he thought about that, um, pretty much the very next day. And you only demonstrated being able to move things with your mind at that point, correct? So the tests they ran were only based around that? That's right. And growing up, your psychokinesis was pretty weak, right? Izuka shifted in his chair, I mean. Yeah. Because you were suppressing it. I, how do you know that? I consulted with Recovery Girl when I was coming up with your training regiment, all my clarified. Oh. Okay, but what does that have to do with me being misdiagnosed? Recovery girl tapped her cane a few times on the ground, I think you were born with both psychokinesis and fire breath. Or to put it a better way, your quirk had both of these abilities at the start. Izuku scratched his head, but people can't have two quirks, er, naturally I mean. Technically, that's correct, but remember your classmate Todoroki. He can produce fire and ice. At a glance it looks like he has two quirks, but it's really one quirk. Fire from his father and ice from his mother, Izuka thought to himself. But I only had my psychokinesis growing up. Quirks take time to fully develop and our understanding of them is still not an exact science. If you initially only showed si signs of psychokinesis and then got diagnosed that would be the only one you thought you had. After that, I doubt you ever tried to mimic your father's quirk, and you also started to use your own quirk less and less because of your bullying. All of these factors could have led to you completely suppressing your fire breath up until last night. One for all could have given that part of you a shot in the arm and forced it to activate. Gran Torino rubbed his beard, back in the early days of quirks, people thought that a person's quirk was triggered when they were under a great amount of stress or in danger. There are documented cases of this too, though nowadays quirks usually activate when people get to a certain age. But considering the situation you were in, Getting taken away like that. Izuka shuddered at the memory, it wasn't just that. That Nomu was strangling Yurarika. It was killing her, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't focus to use my psychokinesis, and my body was shattered so I couldn't use one for all. 
All I could do was, scream at the thing. You were pushed to a point where the only thing you could do was act in a way that would trigger your fire breath. Izuku sat and thought about it, I don't think my father could have made as much fire as I did, though. One for all must have been boosting it. Perhaps. You used to think your quirk was a more powerful version of your mother's. Even before our training, you used it against that slime villain in a way that was beyond what you thought you could. Perhaps this was another example of that, just with your fire. It's possible you have a more powerful version of both of their quirks. We won't know until we start training this new ability of yours. I'd add that there are a few other things I've noticed about you that lends itself to this theory of mine. After spitting out so much fire, you were overheated and had multiple burns both outside and inside, but they weren't as bad as one would ex expect. Your body has some kind of resistance to heat and flame. And considering how you were still able to fight in the sports festival, even while facing Bakuga's explosions and Todoroki's fire, this resistance might have already been in play. Of course, you could also be too stubborn for your own good, but we'll get into that after we finish with this topic. Izuku blinked at the rather chilly tone of Recovery Girl's voice at the end of that statement, well that's foreboding. So what's your other theory then? Asked Gran Torino. Recovery Girl sighed, this one's a little more tricky. Midoriya's quirk could have gone through an awakening. All Might raised an eyebrow at that, a quirk awakening is a rare occurrence. True, but considering what Midoriya just described, it does fit the documented cases. If certain catalysts are met, say a moment of extreme danger and helplessness, quirks have been known to spontaneously evolve becoming stronger or even gaining aspects that they didn't have before. Izuku frowned. He was aware of the phenomenon but he wasn't sure it fit, but the two things don't really have anything to do with each other. Recovery Girl nodded, your quirk awakened in a way that gave you the ability to save your Arika. I think you awakened your fire breath because you had the potential to have it. Eh? Dominate and recessive genes. The genetics you got from your parents. Some will be dominant over others. This determines things like hair color. Eyes and the shape of your ears. Well, you also got the genes to have either quirk. Your mother's quirk became the dominant one, but you still carried the potential to breathe fire in your genes. When you went through your awakening, your quirk awakened those recessive traits, and your quirk developed the ability to breathe fire. Izuku blinked a few times stunned, can quirks do that? Be that selective? All my tapped his chin, of the cases of quirk awakening I'm aware of, the person's quirk changed in a way that suited the situation they were in. It's not always the case, but that's the overall trend. Quirks are weird, Izuku said with a sigh. So either my quirk always had fire mixed into it, or it awakened and added that trait. I suppose those can work as good excuses. Recovery Girl agreed, I've also spoken with Principal Nizu on the subject. He'll inform the teachers on what they'll need to know. So you don't have to worry about that. He did say he has a name ready for it for the quirk registry. Unless you have any objections to that. Just call it fire breath and be done with it, Gran Torino said with a wave of his hand, no need to worry about that. Black. The three grown-ups all turned to look at Izuku. Surprised that such a childish sound came from him. Even Izuku seemed surprised that he voiced that opinion out loud, air. I take it you have an opinion on that. All Might said with a chuckle. Izuku rubbed his neck, embarrassed, I mean, that's such a boring name. Ha ha ha. All Might laughed while Recovery Girl shook her head muttering about a couple of silly children. Gran Torino rolled his eyes, really kid? That's the only reason you can come up with? Well, it's also the name my father uses. Izuku said while trying not to show his distaste too much, but I think this is like with my mom. While my quirk is similar to hers, it's different enough that it got its own name. So the same should apply with my father. And what's so different about yours? Mine is green. The looks he got for that answer made him stutter out a second reason, and... And mine is stronger. Fine, fine. Let's see what Principal Nizu was going to call it. Recovery Girl said as she leafed through some papers, ah here we go. 
Boric Pyre. Boric? All Might scratched his head at that, um, what's that? Boric acid is a chemical that, when it's ignited, makes a green flame, Izuku answered matter-of-factly. He blinked at All Might's blank stare, my favorite color is green. I kinda know everything about it. All Might, All Might decided not to question that. Pyre, huh? Nizu has a dark sense of humor, Torino said. Recalling how Izuku almost immolated the Nomu that was carrying him away. Izuku scratched his chin, it sounds cool, though. Yeah, I like it. If that's settled, I think we should move on to how we're going to explain the other stuff that happened last night, Gran Torino said. Unless we also want to go with the Quirk Awakening theory. All Might shook his head, I doubt we would be able to get away with that. The fire at least has some kind of logic behind it. No matter what theory you go with. Suddenly having super strength however. It would be best if we could come up with something that didn't go down the line of a new quirk. That would put people too close to learning about one for all, I think. Actually, All Might, Izuku cut in, I've been thinking about it, and I think I have an answer for that part. Oh? Let's hear it then. I could say that the strength is from a new super move I've been working on. A new way to apply my quirk to my body. Tactile psychokinesis. Isn't that supposed to be tactile telekinesis? Gran Torino asked. Izuka shook his head, no. Psychokinesis sounds better than telekinesis. So it's tactile psychokinesis. Gran Torino groaned. Covering his face with a hand, I swear to God. Anyway. Izuku continued on. Being kind enough not to mention that Gran Torino wouldn't know anything about coolness since he wears an oversized yellow blanket as a cape, I could say that I've been trying to figure out a way to better emulate All Might's moves. I already have my Delaware smash, but I wanted to incorporate All Might's smashes with my physical attacks. So I worked on a theory. What if I focused my psychokinesis inside my body? Used my power to move my body. Normally, there are a couple of things that weaken my quirk, trying to use it on a person and distance. While using it on myself on the outside is still hard, if I keep the power inside I could say I'd negated the distance issue to its absolute minimum. All Might thought it over, technically tactile telekinesis, Izuku grumbled psychokinesis, but was ignored, is a power where a person uses their psychic powers through physical contact. It simulates things like flight, super strength, and speed since it's still not their own muscles doing the work, but their mind. Hmm, so you can explain one for all away is just a new way to use your own quirk. Not a bad idea, kid. If that's the story we're going to go with, I'll let Nizu know as well. Recovery Girl said with a nod. The last thing would be explaining how you were able to rip apart a whole street with your mind, but in this case I think we can chalk that up to simple hysterical strength. Izuku didn't have any issue with that idea, yeah, that could work. It's not that far from the truth really. I kinda just let loose at that point. Was more concerned with getting Stain away from my friends than anything else. Clearly, came Recovery Girl's icy reply. Now that all the distractions are out of the way, we can talk about what's actually important. But, um, isn't coming up with plausible stories to explain, Izuku trailed off when Recovery Girl glared at him. She then turned her icy stare at All Might and Gran Torino making sure that all three were giving her their undivided attention. Midoriya, I want you to look at something, Recovery Girl said as she pulled out a large envelope from the folder and opened it. Walking over to the medical light box, Recovery Girl took out a medical slide and stuck it onto the box, before turning on the light. Illuminating the photo that everyone recognized as an MRI of someone's brain. When Izuku saw his name at the bottom corner of the image, he suddenly didn't want to be in the room anymore. I'm going to guess you know what this is? Recovery girl asked. Izuku nodded, that's a scan of my brain. Can I have a copy? I'd like proof for Yurarika that I have, a withering stare stopped Izuku's nervous joke dead in its tracks. It was quickly becoming obvious to everyone that Recovery Girl was not in the mood for games. This is a scan of your brain right after your entrance exam. Do you remember why I had to take this? Izuka shifted nervously in his seat, 
because I got a concussion after taking out the zero pointer. There was also the fact you were bleeding out of your nose like a leaking faucet, but you're right. Fortunately for you, I was able to fix you up just fine. This is a good, healthy looking brain. No medical issues. You made a complete recovery from your concussion. Recovery girl then added, do you remember what I told you when you were leaving? That you didn't want to see me in your office again. Correct. Recovery girl then pulled out another scan and slapped it besides the first, these are scans of your brain after the USJ attack and when I had you come in for a checkup. Recovery girl pointed to the first of the two, notice these dark areas, these indicate trauma that was still present even after my initial healing of you. My head did get a little smashed up that day. Izuku didn't like to think about that day all too much. Yes it did, you're lucky to be alive. Answer me honestly, how much of that day do you actually remember? Scratching his hair, Izuku thought back and frowned, most of it, I think. The start of the attack, but after I got out of the ruined zone, it's pretty foggy. I see images, but, Izuka shrugged, I know enough to know what happened to me at least. Memory loss is common with brain injuries like that. However, if you look at the second image, recovery girl motioned to the same areas where the dark spots had been in the first. They weren't there anymore, you were able to heal on your own after I worked on you and returned back to normal. Recovery girl then pulled out two more scans and stuck them on and pointed at the first one, you. Right after the sports festival. What do you see? Um, Izuku frowned and shifted in his seat some more, more dark spots. While not as bad as the scan after being hit by the Nomu, there were still plenty. That's right, and this time you did these to yourself. After you pushed yourself beyond your limits multiple times and hid the signs you were in trouble. Not liking how angry recovery girl sounded, Izuku quickly looked to the next scan, which he guessed was the checkup he had after the long weekend, but look. The dark areas are gone so that means I healed up again. You fixed me up real good. Recovery girl stayed silent before she pulled out one last scan and put it up for everyone to see. Izuku blinked, not really sure what he was looking at. You were already getting treated by the local staff here for the trauma to your body by the time I arrived and worked on Toga. I used my quirk on you before any MRIs could be run. God only knows what we would have seen, but I can take a very good guess. Especially after this last scan. All my frowned, this would have been taken yesterday afternoon correct? That's right. You'll take one again before you leave, but I don't imagine it'll change much. You were pretty much all healed up at that point. Besides some soreness and weakness in your limbs. Recovery girl. Girl. What are those? Izuku asked, pointing up at the last scan, was there something wrong with the machine or? Recovery girl pointed to one of the few white marks on the scan. There were only a couple, but against the rest of the image, they stood out in sharp contrast, you mean these? It's not a mistake with the image. These are cerebral scars. The room got very quiet after that. Izuko stared at the scan in a daze only vaguely aware of what was around him. He felt dizzy, does this, does this have anything to do with those tests the doctors had me do yesterday? Those were mortar and cognizant tests, recovery girl clarified. How bad is he hurt? After studying the scans and from the results of the tests, the scarring appears superficial. However, I need to make this clear, you've caused damage to your brain that isn't ever going to fully heal. You were already beginning to hurt yourself by ignoring your body's own warning signs and overusing your quirk. Now you have one for all added on top of it and the first time you used it, you hurt yourself in a way that is not going to heal. Scars don't heal. Recovery girl, I'm sure that dash. Oh, you don't get to say a word now. Not after the stunt you pulled. All Might stopped while Recovery Girl then looked at Gran Torino, and that goes for you, too. The sheer recklessness the two of you committed staggers belief. What were you thinking, taking him to Hosa City? All Might straightened up as he spoke, the Hero Commission requested I be in the city. 
it was supposed to be a quick stop. The ride to and from should have lasted longer than the actual stay. I figured young Midoriya would get some good experience watching me work. I couldn't have known the city was going to be attacked. Also, the kid is way stronger than Tashinori was after he got one for all. All. The gap is crazy. If I knew how one for all was going to react to the kid, I would have moved us to the country to do this internship. Away from buildings and people, Gran Torino added. A lot of crap happened last night that no one could have seen coming. We were going off what we knew from decades ago. And the kid wasn't exactly in a situation where he could try out his new quirk safely. Recovery girl shook her head, you two can't afford to make these kinds of mistakes. You both have a responsibility to do better. This boy needs you to do better. After everything he's done. After he's made all the wrong choices, you have to get this fixed. Izuka's head snapped up and a deep frown crossed his face. I understand. Believe me, I understand. I'm just so grateful you've been here to help fix everything. That may not be the case for much longer. All Might tilted his head to the side, confused by Recovery Girl's statement. This pattern I'm seeing. It needs to stop. Midoriya gets himself hurt, and it's just assumed he'll be fine because I'm there to heal him. That's not something I'm comfortable with, Tashinori. He acts like his actions have no consequences because they haven't yet, because of me. Gran Torino watched Recovery Girl carefully, what exactly are you saying, Shuzenji? I'm saying that if you two can't get Midoriya to stop making these horrible, stupid decisions, then I might have to, Recovery Girl looked pale at what she was about to say, then I'll have to ensure that there are consequences. I won't heal him again. Shuzenji. Recovery Girl, please, that's too far. Recovery girl, girl hit her cane against the floor, then make sure it doesn't come to that. Do your jobs as teachers, as mentors, and as people that knew Nana, for God's sake. This is her legacy you two are responsible for. And I cannot continue to use my quirk on someone that isn't learning to take care of themselves. If that means he has to heal without me, then that's what I'll be forced to do because I will not become part of that kind of self-destructive cycle. The three heroes were so caught up in their talk, they had neglected to notice that Izuku was still in the room with them, listening to everything. Izuku sat and listened to Recovery Girl until he couldn't stay silent any longer. His voice carried more frustration than he intended, but once he started, everything that had been built up came crashing out, I haven't done anything wrong. Everyone stopped and turned to look at Izuku as he kept going. His eyes blazing, Aizawa Sensei says I'm wrong. The Chief of Police says I'm wrong. Sir Night Eye says I'm wrong. Now you say I'm wrong, too. Tell me, tell me exactly what I've done wrong. Young Midoriya, hold on a second, All Might was alarmed. He had never heard Izuku talk like this. Recovery Girl was also startled, but she recovered quickly, Young man, do you really need me to tell you you were wrong to fight all those villains? Izuku's face twisted as his frustration morphed into anger. What was I supposed to do? If I did nothing, then Stain would have killed my friends. If I did nothing, then the League of Villains would have killed my friends. If I did nothing, then that slime villain would have killed Kakan. Every time, either there was no one there to help or no one that would help. If you're telling me, if you all are telling me, that I should have done nothing, then I refuse to listen to you. If someone is in trouble, I won't stand by and do nothing. I can't. Heroes are supposed to save people. I refuse to do anything less than that. Izuku, Izuku let himself go limp, falling into his chair as he breathed heavily. He had just let out a great deal of frustration and needed a chance to catch his breath. While Izuku did, All Might flinched hard. Aizawa's warning and reprimand ringing in his ears. Of all the irresponsible, asinine, and just plain stupid things you could have done. You didn't nip that behavior in the bud, no, you reinforced it. You, the greatest hero, told a young child, that, by your own admission, probably did not view himself as having much worth, that his reckless self-endangerment was heroic and then you rewarded him. Today was not an exception, it was part of a pattern. Shit. I don't know. 
It took everyone in the room a second to realize that Recovery Girl had spoken. Her voice was soft and perhaps for the first time in recent memory, she sounded her age, I don't know what to tell you. All I know is that this is wrong. You are a child who shouldn't be forced to make these kinds of decisions. And if we are at the point where you have to, then something has gone horribly, terribly wrong. Midoriya, hearing his name, Izuka looked back up, it's obvious you put others above yourself. You think of them first and foremost because saving lives is important to you. Because you know their lives are important. I understand that feeling. As a hero and a doctor saving others matters. But you have to remember something. Izuku, while most of his frustration had been spent, he still had enough to answer with a tart, what? That you are important too. That there are others out there that view you the same way you view them. They see you as important. Here's to Tenya and Shudo. Two lucky bastards that get to go home while we are stuck here in this hospital with nothing to do, Himiko raised her juice box, filled with real juice, in a mock toast towards her friends. Her voice was dripping with, with so much sarcasm that it was a small wonder no one was washed away in the deluge. Ochako smirked, I'm leaving tomorrow. If Miruko was able to handle a little paperwork I'd be gone today. She really needs to get organized dash Himiko's juice box, after getting sucked dry, promptly smacked Ochako in the face, hey. Traders will be silent. After being the last of the group to finish his checkup, Izuku and company had met up to have lunch. Midnight, sensing that being cooped up inside the hospital was making the kids antsy, was able to pull some strings and set up a small table out on the hospital's roof so the group could enjoy some nice weather while they ate and hung out. While she and Aizawa were on guard duty, they kept their distance so the group could enjoy themselves without the adults breathing down their necks. I'm glad you're going to be able to finish out your internship, Yurarika, Izuku said with a smile, I think I'm going to be up here for another couple of days. Oof, Ochako winced in sympathy, why's that? Izuku groaned, because recovery girl wants to make sure I'm all healed up. I think she's just punishing me or something. Tenya's hand chopped through the air quickly as he spoke up, Midoriya. Recovery girl is an esteemed doctor and member of the UA staff. If she feels you require an extra day to rest to fully recover, then you would be wise to listen to her and not complain. Izuku wasn't convinced. He was sure Recovery Girl was keeping him here just to make sure he couldn't go running off with All Might, who seemed to be in the doctor's doghouse. Of course, he couldn't say this out loud, so he just shrugged and went back to his lunch. Ochako elbowed him, hey, I'd say having to spend a couple of days here is getting off light after the stunt you pulled. Hey! Izuku cried in shock, you can't hold anything that happened last night against me since it technically never happened. It's also very hypocritical of you to use Midoriya's actions against him, him Yurarika, Shudo said evenly, considering that after we got his text and put together what might be happening, you started running even faster. Eep. Himiko smirked, you know, you're not as guilt-free as you like to act, Ochako. You've run into just as many dangerous situations as Izuku has. Izuku blinked a few times, hey, as he started to think about that, hey. You're right. Ochako gulped at the sudden turn of events, there is a huge difference. I ran into dangerous situations to pull this boy's butt out of the fire. Izuku crossed his arms and pouted, that's what I was doing with Ida. Izuku then puffed up and pointed at himself, I was worried he was getting into trouble so I went looking for him. Shudo rubbed his chin, how did you find Ida and Toga anyway? I can't imagine you were just running around at random. Izuku's confidence vanished instantly and he deflated back down, humming to himself, this is a really nice lunch Midnight Sensei was able to put together for us, don't you think? Dikwawu, Ochako narrowed her eyes at Izuku while the boy started to sweat. Poking his fingers together, Izuku mumbled an answer. The group leaned forward while the glare and raised eyebrow form Ochako made it clear he wasn't going to get away with that kind of response, I, went looking for Ida where I thought Stain would be. Ochako glared at Izuku, who tried inching away from her, but Himiko scooted over from his other side and cut off his escape, take your lumps, hero, she said with a chuckle. Desperate, desperate to change the topic and focus attention off himself, Izuku looked over at Tenya and focused on the first thing that stood out to him, oh, Ichida. How did your last checkup go? 
I guess everything's fine since you're getting released. I was worried since you got stabbed. But the bandages are off your arms now. Tenya stopped eating and looked down at his arm, I have been cleared to go home, yes, but. I was informed of a complication. Everyone stopped and looked at him. Realizing he had caused a sudden drop in the mood, Tenya smiled and held up his hands, it's nothing overly serious, so please don't worry like that. One of the stab wounds caused some ligament and nerve damage. As a result, I have a slight loss of dexterity and some numbness in my fingers. He flexed his hand a few times, I was informed that the damage is reversible with some surgery, and that the procedure is not even invasive. Well, that's good at least, Ochako said with a sigh of relief, so is there a reason you're not doing it here? Does your family want to use their own doctor or something? Tenya shook his head, I've elected to wait to get the procedure. Tenya saw the confused looks on his friends' faces and explained, you see, I got this wound because I acted in a shameful manner. I was anything but heroic. As such, until I've made up for my mistakes and I'm sure I will not repeat them once I'm a hero, I'll keep this wound as a reminder to never waver from the path I've chosen as a hero. To be like my brother. Izuku and Shuto looked at Tenya solemnly. Shuto unconsciously scratched at his scar on his face while Izuku tried very hard not to think of the white spots on his MRI. While neither boy looked ready to say anything about Tenya's decision, Himiko and Ochako both weren't of the same mind, no offense, but that makes no sense to me, Himiko said. So to make up for being a bad hero, you're going to intentionally make it harder to become a good hero? Tenya blinked, it's not as big a deal as you think it is. As I said, the effect is only a slight loss of feeling and use of my fingers. But it's still a handicap. I get you like to kick, but what if you have to use that hand and it being weak costs you? I? Ochako cut in, I agree with Toga. I get what you're trying to do, Ida. You made a mistake, and I bet everything getting pushed under the rug doesn't really sit right with you. So you're trying to come up with a way to punish yourself. Tenya shifted in his seat as Ochako practically hit the nail on the head. Ida, if you want to make up for what you did, do it through your actions going forward. Not through an action. Which is the only thing having a hurt hand will give you. Tenya sat silently, pondering over what Ochako and Himiko had said. He had been so sure he was doing the right thing, but perhaps he needed to rethink his course of action. After all, he got into this mess because he had tried to handle everything himself and cut off his friends, I will, talk with my family on the matter. I'm sure my brother would also have opinions on the subject. Ochako and Himiko both seemed satisfied with that. So you're going back home then and not continuing to train with Manuel? Izuku asked. Manuel suggested I take the rest of my internship and spend it with my family. Give my body and soul a chance to heal. Himiko nodded with a hum of approval, for a guy called the normal hero, he gives pretty good advice. He also offered to continue with Toba's internship if she wanted, though the teachers said it would be best that she remain under UA's watch until things calm down. It shows he is a hero of good character to want to continue training Yutoga. Himiko waved Tenya off, yeah, yeah, he's one of the good ones. Hey, what about you Shudo? You going home or back to work? I will be returning with my father to his agency. I wasn't injured during the fight, so there is no reason for my time to be cut short. Also, the group swore the air around them got a little chilly, after getting dragged into the stain cover-up, I'm sure he will be in a rotten mood having to share credit with All Might. I want to be there to see that eat him up for myself. Shudo's group of friends all stared at him and at the same time all thought the same thing. Wow. Shuto is petty. That's awesome. Damn Todoroki, you're fucking cold. Note to self, Todoroki holds a grudge. Such a strange thing for Todoroki to say. Since everyone else had been talked about, save one, Himiko decided she wasn't waiting any longer to get some answers. So Himiko leaned forward, hands clasped together with her two pointer fingers held out, so Izuku. Izuku chirped at the sudden attention as everyone turned to look at him. Some unspoken agreement between everyone that it was time for some answers. I think I speak for everyone when I ask, Himiko paused for dramatic effect, 
What in the holy fuck was up with you last night? With the eyes of everyone now focused squarely on him, Izuku gathered up all the courage he could muster and shrugged, air. I dunno. When it looked like Ochako and Himiko were ready to jump him, Izuku quickly went over what he had discussed with Recovery Girl on the topic and his side of the story to cover the rest. The two theories behind his new Boric Pyre, which got an excited clap from Himiko and a good-natured ribbing from Ocha Ochako because she knew he picked that name because he thought it was cool. And he explained how he suddenly seemed like he had super strength. A discreet thumbs up from Ochako showed she had good opinions on how he had explained away one for all. I see, so you don't have two quirks then like I do. Shudo said calmly, I admit, I would have been a little upset if you had been holding back after everything that happened in our match. Izuku laughed nervously, yeah. That would make me a pretty horrible hypocrite. Still, you need to work to get control of your fire. The amount of heat and flame you used was on par with myself and my father. You can't afford to not have control over that. Izuku nodded solemnly, I know. I don't want to accidentally hurt someone. Or yourself. Shudo added, you need to figure out if your quirk has a way to regulate your body temperature. If not, you should have had some make something for you. Your fire could end up being more of a danger to yourself than others. Tenya spoke up, do you have any advice on how to control and use fire that could help Midoriya, Todoroki? His boric pyre doesn't seem to have a lot or anything in common with his psychokinesis. To try and learn a whole new quirk like this, I'm worried he may fall behind in class if his concentration is on this and not also mastering his original quirk like the rest of us are doing. Izuku and Ochako both added learning to control one for all to the list of issues. Shudo frowned, Midoriya. Yeah? You inherited your quirk from your mother, correct? Or at least half of it? Yes? Izuku suddenly didn't like where this conversation was about to go. Does that mean your father breathes fire? Izuku, Izuku didn't answer and took a few bites from his lunch. Ochako answered for him, he does. Then if that's the case, you should ask him a dash. No, Izuku said immediately. Midoriya you dash, Shudo tried to start but Izuku cut him off. I said no. Izuku spat out his words but his anger was quickly replaced with shock. Green tongues of flame burst from his mouth as he spat out his words, making him quickly cover his mouth with his hands. Slightly panicked and more than a little ashamed, Izuku picked up his drink and quickly drank it down to quench the flames in his mouth. Though the move was more symbolic as his quirk had stopped the moment he had stopped yelling. Is everything alright over there? Midnight was up and walking towards the group. She and Aizawa had been startled by the sudden burst of fire out of Izuku's mouth. Aizawa had his eyes trained on Izuku. Just in case. Himiko waved her off, we're fine. Stay over there and let us hang out, she paused and looked at Izuku slightly worried, we're fine, right? Izuku nodded, yeah. Yeah it's fine. Midnight waited a few more seconds before going back to Aizawa, and the group was again left to themselves. Izuka buried his face in his hands, I really am going to have to call him, aren't I? Shuto nodded while he lifted his hand up and ignited a small burst of fire in his palm. The fire danced around as he spoke, you're in the same situation I'm in, Midoriya. I don't think you hate your new fire like I hated mine for so long, but it's still connected to something painful. Even so, we both have a responsibility to master our fire. I chose to go to my father because he was the best person to help me. Who's the best person to help you learn how to control yours? Izuku, Izuku couldn't argue the point, which really sucked. So with a grunt, Izuku leaned back in his chair and relented, okay. Okay. I'll call him. When I get home. Izuku noted the questioning looks he was getting from everyone and held up his hand in defense, it had been a really rough couple of days. Let me get through my internship or whatever is going to be left of it before I deal with my father, please. Everyone agreed that was a fair compromise. Fortunately for Izuku, Himiko, knowing that dealing with sucky family sucks, decided to switch to a new topic, you know, I met someone that could breathe fire. Guy was cool. He was like this freaky combo of a blue wolf and a snake, 
Himiko said as she rubbed her chin. Izuku's eyes lit up, oh wow, that's an interesting combo for a mutation quirk. And he could breathe fire? Oh yeah, he was awesome. Unfortunately, he was with this group of douchebags that tried recruiting Mr. Stain to their cause. There was this one bitch that was just hanging on their leader. Total groupie energy. Like, come on woman, have some self-respect. I mean, who just hangs onto a guy like that? Shudo looked at Himiko, then at Ochako. He wisely chose not to say anything. Oh? So they were a group of villains then? Ochako said while Izuku listened curiously. Neither really paying attention to that last bit. Yeah. This guy saw himself as a king or some shit. Thought the world only belonged to the strong. He figured his world would be perfect for Mr. Stain and tried to get him to join forces. They actually talked a lot, but I ignored them and hung out with the cool guy. I could tell he was really strong, too. But yeah, he smoked these cigars and could do this really cool trick where he'd puff out some fire and light the cigar in his mouth. Ochako blared at Izuku when she saw the wheel start to turn in his, his head, you're not allowed to start smoking Deku. Oh come on, I'm not going to pick up an unhealthy habit like that, Izuku complained with an eye roll. So what happened to this group? Tenya asked, are they still at large? They sound dangerous. Not sure. Mr. Stain passed on their offer, and we went our separate ways. Miss that big guy, he was like a big, fluffy death machine. But his leader and Mr. Stain must have come to some kind of understanding, though, since both our groups walked away amicably. That's not normally how it goes. Groups meet, hate something about the other, and then one or both die. Himiko smiled at the fun memory before reaching for her food, oh hey, I just thought of something. Izuku, did Recovery Girl have a theory for why your glow went from green to red? That have anything to do with your new super move? What was it called again? Tactile Psychokinesis. Tenya rubbed his chin as a thought accrued to him, wait. Isn't the term supposed to be tactile tell dash? Nope. Izuku cut in. Ochako rolled her eyes, you just think your version sounds cooler. Well, it does. You are such a dork. Izuku ignored her and turned his attention back to Himiko, but to answer your question, I'm not sure. That was the first time I, Izuku finished in his head with used one for all, but said out loud, I tried using the move. So I don't know if that's just how my quirk will react to it being used that way. Technically, you were glowing red before you used the technique. It was like your normal aura when you use your quirk, just the wrong color. When you then attacked Stain, it changed. You weren't glowing, really. It looked like your legs and arms were filled with energy. There were red streaks crossing over your skin, Tenya stated, remembering what he had seen. I wasn't really worried about holding back when I attacked Stain first. Recovery Girl says it was probably something like hysterical strength. I was just pushing myself without worrying about the kickback. After that, I was moving on instinct. I just wanted to make Stain go away. So I filled myself up with my power and just, went after him. Without worrying about the kickback huh, Ochako thought to herself bitterly, maybe you should be more careful in the future. Not a fan of you bleeding out of every hole in your head. Or your limbs turning into limp noodles. I agree, Midoriya, Tenya said seriously, in full class rep mode, I can still recall how you looked after taking out that zero pointer. It was not pleasant. I feel like I should warn you to be more careful with your quirks going forward. Obviously you should be careful with your new fire, but I'd also advise that you not use this new move again until you have mastered it. While incredibly powerful, the damage it did to your body was horrific. I say this as your friend and class representative. You are exceptionally lucky you suffered no permanent damage to yourself. I suppose that's a testament to your fortitude and the abilities of Recovery Girl. Izuku choked down a bite of his food before quickly nodding his head, yup. Back to normal. Tenya smiled in relief, excellent, though considering the extent and variety of your injuries, it makes sense that Recovery Girl is being careful before she releases you. 
Ochako and Himiko glanced briefly at one another while Izuku went back to eating. Himiko with a raised eyebrow and Ochako with a slight frown. Both then eyed Izuku before they turned back to their own meals. While Tenya and Shuto may have missed it, they had seen the momentary panic in Izuku's eyes before he answered. It was not long after that the group had finished their lunch and Tenya and Shuto stood ready to leave. As everyone began to say their goodbyes, Midnight walked over, before you two go, I think we have one last piece of business to finish. The group, group glanced at each other then at her, finally noticing that Midnight had not walked over empty-handed. In one hand, she had a small metal fire bucket, packed with newspaper, and whatever she had in her other hand she tossed over to Himiko. Himiko caught the balled-up item and held it up after unrolling it. Her cut-up hero mask flapped in the light breeze, wah? Midnight put down the bucket and plucked a lighter out of it, thought this might be a good time to do a little symbolic burning. Himiko's jaw dropped, wait, you said my costume was too expensive to burn, when she noticed that her friends were giving her questioning look she added, I wanted to destroy my old costume. I designed it to look like Mr. Stain. And, well, can't exactly go on wearing it after this whole shit that went down. So I thought burning it would be a nice little symbolic gesture that I was past that part of my life or past wanting him in my life. Or some combo of the two. While everyone took that in, Midnight tossed Himiko the lighter, the rest of your costume will get recycled into whatever you design for your new one. But if you still want to burn something, well, I don't think a single mask will be that big a deal. Okay you need to stop that, Himiko said as she took everything and started getting set up. Midnight's head tilted to the side as she watched Himiko work, stop what? Doing stuff that makes me like you, Himiko could feel the smile on Midnight's face even if she wasn't looking at the other women. Deciding she wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of acknowledging it, she looked over at her friends, so you all want to hang around for this? The chorus of yes made Himiko smile brightly. Taking the lighter, she set the newspaper ablaze and, once it was going, she pocketed the lighter and held her mask over the growing fire, well, Mr. Stain. I guess this is it. Over the next few seconds, Himiko held the mask over the fire. Startled to find that opening her hand and letting the mask fall into the fire was much harder than she expected. It should have been easy, but this mask represented a portion of her life she still took pride in, even if it was twisted. She had grown strong as the world around her tried to kill her. She had grown strong so that stain would acknowledge her. And in a twisted, fucked up way, she had gotten her wish. Only the moment Stain had, he had also tried to kill her. He had taken her apart in their fight. Destroying everything that made her look like him. Cutting apart everything she covered herself in to be more like him. He had cut apart their bond so easily, and now she was ready to do the same thing. All she had to do was open her hand. Then she felt a hand on her shoulder, then another. At her side, Izuku and Ochako stood next to her offering her reassuring smiles while Tenya and Shuto besides them also stood with her. She had friends. Glancing over her shoulder she saw Midnight, who still had that annoying smile, and Aizawa as well. She had a really annoying family at UA. Before, she had fought tooth and nail with nothing to survive. Now, she would fight tooth and nail for everything to make sure they all survived. Before, she had nothing. Now, she had everything. And with that thought giving her strength, she opened her hand and let the mask and her past burn away. That will be it for this part. I hope everyone enjoyed if you did please leave a like and comment if you want part 34. If you want to hear more from me subscribe I hope to see you all in the next one.